Guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get awesome people like Mark on, who talk about the future and much, much more of all of us. Because it is all of us. We're on one spaceship together. For good, for bad, for ugly. That's why we've got an optimist here, right? Thanks for coming today, Mark. Uh, thanks for having me. Although I'm not sure I'm an optimist. You're not sure. Any, you, you, kind of, you kind of play that optimist-pessimist line, but call yourself at least optimist on tour. I noticed that in some of your videos. How do you deal with that? The, well, the goodness and badness of what's coming and you got to change things, but you also can't be overly like everything grass is green Zuckerberg ish because then we don't really change much. Yeah. So I call it uh, optimism of ambition and pragmatism of approach. So you have to be very aware of the challenges that the future is asking us and they are enormous and scary. Um, but if you if you're not literate about those challenges, isn't you can't do anything about them. So the first thing is to make yourself literate about the challenge, and then you go and find people who can solve it. And, you know, so there are grand challenges, but there are grand solutions out there. So I'm optimistic by the innovation I see and the people that I write about in my books and I work with in my business. But yeah. that doesn't doesn't take away from the fact that the challenges we face in terms of inequality, climate change, failure of the markets, uh, failures in healthcare, governance, etc., are not you know enormous, and it's going to be a very messy 30 years. I like the concept you have of future literate, of not solving one problem, but understanding systems. Can you elaborate a little? Well, the, the, you have to think in systems because they're all related. Uh, you know, you cannot separate the problems of, you know, climate change from the way, you know, what the, the things that we value in the marketplace. You cannot separate that from how we govern ourselves. You cannot separate that from how we think about education, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and the problem with a lot of solutions in inverted commas is they'll, they'll attack one thing without really understanding the systemic kind of causes of what's causing that problem in the first place. So they end up being sort of sticking plastic. And in fact, I'm doing some consultancy with some big um, NGOs and uh, charities who I won't name out courtesy. And because it, I'm under contract not to, um, you know, going to that very process at the moment where that, where, you know, they might have a an ambition to, I don't know, eradicate poverty, for instance, or something like that. And uh, I'll be going, well, you've been doing this for 30 years and you haven't eradicated poverty because actually you're not dealing with the root causes of poverty. What you're doing is doing a sticking plaster at the top of, you know, trying to help people who are already in poverty rather than dealing with the case, causes of poverty in the first place. So you have to understand all these systems and that, that requires a certain amount of literacy. It's not actually that hard to get, I don't think. It's just that we are rewarded and motivated to stay in our boxes and not ask the big questions. And that's where people end up justifying their little bit without realizing that the system they work for maybe passed itself by date. Exactly. And the education system is built like this. You've got your math class, your science class, and we don't want to mix these, whatever we do. Is, no. that, is that where it all starts? Um, it's a good question. I mean, it's certainly one of the places it starts. The idea that you specialize and you become an expert in one thing. Now, I'm nothing against that, by the way. I'm nothing against people. You know, if I had needed brain surgery, I want a brain surgery specialist. You know, I don't want a generalist who's, you know, a bit of a brain surgeon and a bit of a rock guitarist, uh, you, know, and, you know, and a bit of a project manager at the same time. You know, I probably want a brain surgery specialist. But when it comes to things, questions, climate change, governance, education, etc., then then you need to think in systems. And what they do in education system is they take the systems out. They go, right, we're going to do science over here, we're going to do art over here, we're going to do creative thinking a bit over there, uh, we're going to do health over here, we're going to do you know, history over here. And actually, to have a, fully un a full understanding of the systems, you need to understand the emotional, the physical, the scientific as well. Otherwise, otherwise you're just, well, you're not literate about the, the big picture. So yeah, I think a lot of it does start in school where, where there's no linking of those things. And actually, what's really annoying about that is actually that's where all the interesting stuff is, right? That's the stuff that makes learning fun. It's the interplay of the history, the science, the art, the politics, the culture. That's where all the, the fun stuff is, and that's what they strip out. <laughs> you know, so when you do the science, you know, do a science class at school, they never teach you about the characters really behind the science or what was motivating them or what was happening, you know, in that period of history, which meant that that innovation had to happen. And that's all the stuff that gives you the emotional engagement with the subject in the first place. So, yeah, I think it's definitely one of the places it starts. So how do we deal with those type of problems where there's kind of the two things? There's A, understanding, and then there's B, valuing. So, for instance, there was there was an old movie a while back. i got to bring this up. And it was, um, I want to say Chris Rock was running for president. And he was running for president against this one guy, this vice president, who was like the worst caricature of a possible presidential candidate you can love. And it, um, he, I mean, he looks just like Trump now, but it was more like, God bless America and no place else. That was his slogan. 
Yeah. And it's kind of, how do we think about the, the dynamics of all of these problems where we can understand solutions, but we have to understand them and also value them in similar ways. For instance, if you're living in Japan, you might care more about climate change than if you're living in Nebraska. Uh, well, that's a very good question. I mean, there's a great quote by Mark Twain, which is, travel is fatal to prejudice. And I think it's the role of particularly people with any degree of power or influence, whether that's come from, from privilege or they've earned it separately, is to travel. And I don't just mean travel physically, I mean travel intellectually and emotionally. So, um, you know, it, you started off this podcast actually with a really interesting observation about us all being on the same planet, Spaceship Earth. And there's, um, there, isn't an, there isn't an astronaut that came back from space that didn't become an environmentalist. Because that act of traveling and seeing the whole thing as one spaceship changed pretty much everybody's view. They call it the overview effect. So I think it's essential that we we travel as much as possible, you know, intellectually, emotionally, artistically, culturally, scientifically. And again, this comes back to the point about education, which actually says, uh, don't travel widely. Travel to these very specific destinations. And by the way, don't look out the window while you're there because everything's in the box that we put you in. So, I mean, my life is an exercise in travel in all those ways. And that's sort of why I have the work that I do and why, you know, I end up being considered some kind of innovative, creative thinker. And it's not that I'm innovative or creative. It's just that I've traveled. I mean, Steve Jobs said this rather brilliantly. He said, um, creative people feel guilty because they didn't really do it. And what he means is that they have seen so many different things because they traveled, they're curious, that suddenly idea B and idea C put together seem obvious because they've seen them both. But somebody's only spent their life in box A will never have seen B and C. So the, the, the idea of even juxtaposing them is not available to them. So it is really a matter, I think, of, of travel. And that's, I guess, what's so upsetting about the political system we have, because it, it, it puts people in the box and says, you're either forced or against us. You're either, you know, one kind of person or another. Um, and that absolutely destroys travel. So you end up with Democrats and Republicans hating each other and never traveling into each other's mindsets or concerns um, as human beings. So, yeah, it's a, it's a big old problem. So travel. Travel in the broadest sense is my answer. Where's the most transformative travel experience you've had? Having children. I mean, that's a hell of a journey. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. you got to become a little bit more optimistic and work a little bit harder, right? Um, I don't think I became more optimistic or worked harder, but certainly the travel you have to do inside yourself to find levels of patience and empathy and long-term thinking on a very personal level that you didn't have before, I think. And I've just had a second. My, my, my second son is three weeks old um, yesterday. And you're uh, doing this interview right now. <laughs> wow. No, I haven't even seen a sip of coffee yet. I'm impressed. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And also, I think, I mean, the other one, of course, is falling in love with my, my wonderful wife. And that, that, that is, a, you know, to do that properly, that's a hell of an intellectual journey and, and emotional journey. I mean, but also, I mean, in my day job, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, more obvious examples. You know, I went diving with the president of the Maldives to talk about climate change and underwater cabinet meeting. I went to the Australian Outback to look at sustainable meat farming. You know, you know, I've been to MIT to meet brilliant scientists. And, you know, so there's all those standard things. But it's it's the travel that changes the way you feel that's the most important, because if, once you once you feel something, you can't unfeel it. I think an under, just, the underwater climate uh, cabinet meeting is certainly not standard. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that out there now. That would be valuable for everybody, unfortunately. Probably a little expensive for for a lot. Yeah, but, and in the woods, so. <laughs> and underwater, so the communication's a little tough. What yeah. um, where do you see the the biggest areas of innovation happening right now? What excites you? Um, well, I don't see any biggest areas. I think there's innovation everywhere. In every um, sphere and discipline. Um, so I don't think, you, 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 you know, it's not like, you know, things are happening more in digital than they are in chemistry than they are in, you know, uh, politics or governance. There are all sorts of people doing interesting things in all these areas. Um, there are some things that are far more urgent than others, and therefore I'm more interested in them because I think we need to sort those problems out. And so back to actually the stuff we were just talking about, um, there's some really amazing schools trying to build scalable models of education that will work for everybody and create a, you know, a literate populace for the future. Uh, there are some interesting innovations in governance that I'm particularly excited about that can sort of end this ridiculous partisan left, right, you know, pit one person against each other model that we have at the moment. But of course, the really big one is climate change. And we 
absolutely have to deal with that ASAP. Otherwise, every, every other innovation makes no sense. So if you're looking at whether it's people coming up with sustainable agriculture that puts carbon back into the soil, which is really exciting, or um, I'm part of a network over here, which is all about carbon removal from the atmosphere. There's some very interesting stuff going on now. I wish we didn't have to even think about it, but we do. Um, there's interesting business models about how we might start to value uh, the climate and the environment properly. Um, so I think those are the things that are uh, occupying my time at the moment um, because I think they're the most, most urgently needed. I definitely like the first two, and I think they have more promise because a lot of times people, it's very hard to get someone to change to something they should do, even if they know they should do it, when there's that short-term pain. Just look yeah. at the number of people that eat at McDonald's around the world. And yeah. we can kind of see that the long-term thinking isn't totally there. How do we solve a problem like that as a society? Does it have to be some people take action and force the others into it? Does it have to be a, I'm Elon Musk and I have, or I'm Jeff Bezos and I have a hundred billion dollars and I decided to fix the problem myself or our government's going to do this who pretty much seem incapable of anything at the moment. Well, I think it, I think it all, everybody's got their role to play, right? And, and you know, Elon Musk has a, a bunch of levers that he can use because of where he's come from and his background and his governments have theirs and individuals have theirs. And the question actually is more fundamental is how do you make people want to make that change? You know, uh, why does Elon Musk do what he does? Well, it's because he feels something. He feels it's very important. He has an emotional calling to do that. Governments don't quite often, investors don't quite often. They're kind of, you know, there's a great um, quote by Upton Sinclair. It's very difficult to get somebody to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. So you can know this stuff you need to change. But actually, if your job is in the current system, then changing the current system, which then may threaten your job, becomes emotionally difficult. So the real, the, the sort of the cornerstone of my work and the way I get organizations to change and people to change and investors to change the way they spend their money is to do two things simultaneously. Now, it all comes from my sort of uh, my background in, in well, my other career in the arts. Um, and that is you have to make people feel emotionally uncomfortable where they are. So they feel like this is not a nice place to be. I'm feeling not happy with where I am. But you have to simultaneously make it emotionally heroic where they're going to go. So over here, where the solution is, this is where the best parties are. This is where you're going to meet the hottest people. You're going to have the most interesting sex with the most interesting people. You're going to go to better parties. You're going to be regarded as a hero 10 years from now. Uh, this is where the new careers are, all that kind of stuff. So you make it emotionally hard where they are and emotionally heroic where they need to go. And we create their own little hero's journey for them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they'll create their own. But if they're if they're emotionally comfortable where they are, they're never going to move. How do you make uh, sense? But, but if they're emotionally uncomfortable and then give them nowhere to go, then you've just disenfranchised them. How do you make them emotionally uncomfortable without being being like the Peter person who throws the, the stained uh, leather on top of the, the celebrity or something just completely outlandish? What's the best way to do that constructively? Well, I mean, there's all sorts of ways. I mean, I uh, say I have another career as, a, as an artist and a writer and as a comedian. And a comedian like, as well. How would that go? Uh, it goes great. I mean, I've, I've just got a, a, a play touring the UK at the moment, which is a comedy I wrote with a friend. Um, comedy is a really good way of doing it, actually, because people laugh at the truth. Uh, generally, the best, the, the comedy that we usually laugh at hardest is usually the truest. So if you can get someone to laugh at something about themselves, then you've kind of got them. You know, there's a great cartoon I use a lot in presentations, uh, which you've probably seen it's by Tom Toro. It's from the New Yorker. And it's, a, it's this guy sitting outside a burning city with three children, and, and he's saying, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. And uh, I use that cartoon quite a lot, and everybody laughs. And I'll use that in front of a bunch of investors, and I'll go, right, so now we've agreed that shareholder value is probably not the motivation we should be having, okay? Now, I could have spent three days with presentations about the, the shortfall or the shortcomings of shareholder value as, as a metric. But if I can get someone to laugh at that in 30 seconds, it's like, I've got you, we all agreed. And I can, so humor is a really good way of, of doing that. One of the things I, 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 I often do with clients is I'll, I'll, I'll do this exercise that I call learning from dinosaurs. So you'll go and look at an industry, for instance, that didn't really understand digital and the problems that went wrong there. So you look at the kind of the, the famous examples, the, the codex and the, and the blockbusters and all those kind of people. And you'll ask people to go, look, tell me what went wrong with these people. Tell me how these multi-million dollar companies run by smart, intelligent, erudite, probably quite well-traveled people, how they got this so wrong. 
And what you'll find is executives the world over will come up with a brilliant, cogent, very smart analysis of what went wrong. And then you'll, and then I'll do a bit where I'll kind of go, well, here is the future and here's what's happening with technology and artificial intelligence and climate and governance and whatever. So I'm going to pick a whole bunch of other industries that are being asked some difficult questions at the moment. Um, and tell me what's going to go wrong with these people if they don't understand these questions. And again, they'll come up with a slightly more difficult, they'll come up with a really cogent analysis. And I'll go, that's great. You're just, this is clear why you are the leaders of this company because you're just so good at this. And then you just go, right, what happens with you? Because you've done everybody else. You don't know everybody else that got it wrong. I've just let you do everybody else who's going to get it wrong. So what makes you special? And then they have to turn it on themselves, but they, they've got nowhere to run then because they can't say, oh, this won't affect us. And one of the things I quite often do is I get companies to write their own obituary. So it's 10 years from now, write your own obituary. And I've had whole organizations change their strategy just based on that one exercise because suddenly they read the obituary and go, oh, my God, that is going to happen if we don't do something now. So it's, it's one way of you know, guiding people to making them emotionally uncomfortable. But you, don't, you do it with kindness. I mean, humor is brilliant. If you can make somebody laugh, even at an uncomfortable truth, you still like the comedian. Like you go and see Chris Rock, you mentioned earlier, you know, he'll do a joke about relationships and you'll kind of go, he's close to the bone and I'm laughing because actually I'm, I'm that asshole. Uncomfortable, yeah. Yeah, I'm that asshole, but I'm laughing at my own assholes. Richard Pryor was brilliant at this. Richard Pryor was the guy who, he talked about some of the most uncomfortable stuff you can imagine and he always made himself the butt of the joke, which allowed you to see those uh, problems in yourself and laugh at them and then learn from them. And that's the kind of comedy I use all the time. My, my training as a stand-up, I would say, was the most valuable thing I ever used in the boardroom. And what's, your, what's the play that you're doing now? Uh, it's called Up to Pursuit. It's basically a farce, but what it is really, it's about drawing parallels between criminal activity that is considered criminal by the establishment and then criminal activity that is considered legal by the establishment. So it's about the relationships between the insurance industry and, um, and the mafia and how the two actually in some ways... Uh, have very similar business practices. Oh, they do. They're, they're net negatives on the world, both of them. Yeah. It ends up with a dinner party with you know the the boss of the crime underworld and the head of the biggest IT com uh, uh, sorry insurance company having had dinner with each other, not realizing that they're actually working together by some farcical situation that I've set up. And there's a there's an octopus in it as well, just just for the comedy value. <laughs> I think uh, I think comedy would have a similar aspect to sci-fi in terms of getting people to dispense to suspend their disbelief and then understand something they inherently knew. You can you can kind of do that through the creativity and art side of things in a way you can't in the business world. Yeah, uh, and you know um, what's interesting about that though, on the uh, conversely, is if you go into arts organizations, you know museums, art galleries, um, a lot of artists actually their own practice is completely archaic. So I'm always amazed when I'm asked to go and consult like a sort of an artistic organization. I go, I thought you guys would be way ahead on the future. Isn't that your job? And often they're like, oh, my God, you, you still think it's 1917. You're almost priding yourself on the fact that you haven't changed the way you think about this question. And that drives me crazy. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the power of the arts. I mean, this is what, you know, this is interesting to me again. We come back to education where you know, in a world of, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning, where the machines are going to outperform us in a silicon heartbeat on many of the stuff that many of the things that our current education system wants you to be brilliant at. Um, where are you going to learn the skills to survive and thrive in that world? Where it's going to be, it's in the arts, it's in the creative subjects, it's in the kind of the art, you know, or the team sports. Things that have, force you to work with other people in changing situations or come up with new ideas. And yet, where do we place, you know, the arts and sports in in our academic hierarchy? There for the kids that aren't the cleverest, which is dumb, you know, because the, the kind of smarts you get from those subjects are the kind of smarts you're going to need. I think we need to redesign the entire education system, but let's say I just gave you a miniature wand. You could kill two classes and add two classes. What would you do and why? Well, it's kind of, I mean, it's an interesting thought. It's a kind of, it's a kind of a false question because obviously you wouldn't go about it that way, but I like the question because it, it, it may reveal something. I would... I would certainly add philosophy uh, as as a key subject from the get go, and probably another class which I would, which kind of related. You could argue it's almost the same thing, which I would label empathy and or sentiment, understanding how people feel in a situation. So, for instance, if you study economics, right, um, which you can, of course. 
nowhere in any economics course anywhere in the world is there a psychology um, uh, module as far as I can work out I've ever seen which is ridiculous because economics is all about sentiment it's all about crowd thinking it's all about how people handle risk and that is actually a very emotional thing so how can you expect us to understand economics if you don't understand sentiment so I think you know that understanding of how other people think empathy I, I guess I'd add what I'd probably call the intellectual and emotional travel subject and uh, I don't think I'd remove any because I think they all have value, but they only have value within the context. What I say when I'm working with educational audiences is that s subjects taught in the absence of systems are 95% useless. That doesn't mean that subjects are useless if they're, t if they're taught within a system and then you want to specialize in your thing that you understand the bigger context. That's fine. So I don't think I'd remove anything, but I'd certainly add that systemic thinking around it. And some schools are doing that quite well. You know, not enough, but there are, there are definitely some examples of it. Yeah, we could shorten all of the additional classes. You change the constraints, but it, it's, still or, a, it's still a valuable thought experiment. I think classes in and of themselves is a strange idea. The idea that you study a thing for you know, a set period of time, then you move on to another subject. It's kind of weird. Some of the greatest schools I've seen, they just have big questions they ask at the beginning of each term and go, right, we're going to investigate this yeah. for like the next 10 weeks. And all the classes and subjects and ideas and creative all merge together into one. I'm exploring the Montessori idea now, which seems to be a lot more along those lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's lots of, I mean, this is not rocket science. It's not like we haven't had people saying this for years and years and years. The problem with education is that we value what we can measure. And unfortunately, it is almost impossible to measure the kind of skills that actually mark out a great entrepreneur or, or a literate citizen. And those are questions of empathy, asking the right question. Uh, thinking in systems, uh, how, how well, how good are you at collaborating? All that kind of those things are hard to examine, and therefore we don't, because governments want metrics to say that our education system is doing better or worse than when the last people were in power. Yeah, we're producing more widgets for factories and and, exactly. and uh, offices, right? We're, we're pulling it off. Yeah, uh, but I mean, you know, there. Are, so people will, for instance, you know, get at the OECD um, people, the people, the PISA ratings, which everybody goes on. That. And actually, if you go to PISA and the OECD, they're doing some really interesting work trying to work out better metrics for those kind of skills. And that, you know, so it's not like we don't know this. What we have is inertia, huge amount of inertia, because the problem with education is that every um, every story about education soon soon becomes autobiography. You go to an education minister in the UK, and what they will what they will do, whether they're knowing it or not, is they'll try and recreate the education system in the image of what they went through, because it worked all right for them. You know, or, or because if they had to go through it, you have to go through it too. Yeah, one or the other. Uh, you know, um, Ken Robinson, who's a fairly controversial figure because he has you know views in one particular way about education, says this rather brilliant thing: he says, "Education is kind of like money or religion; it goes deep with people." You know, it, uh, there's a great quote from a song by um, uh, XTC, one of my favorite bands. You know, it says, you may leave school, but it never leaves you. So that's, that is one of the, it's the, one of the emotional, back to emotion again, it's one of the emotional crucibles in which you're formed. And therefore, you justify yourself. So, well, you know, I am me. I value myself. I went through the schooling system as it was. So therefore, you know, I need my kids to go through that too. Even at the same time, intellectually, you might be saying, actually, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. Parents are often the worst people, you know, they keep complaining about the education system being terrible. And then when you ask them to actually do anything innovative, they're like, oh, I feel a bit nervous about that. Uh, there's an example in my last book of a, of a school that transformed itself. But one of the first things the teacher wanted to do, because this was a primary school, was remove the, the, the chairs from the classroom. It's just, you know, toddlers and you know, seven-year-olds, they don't want to sit in rows and chairs. That's not how they learn. None of us learn like that. So you want, you know, the first simple thing you want to do is let's just take the chairs out. Let's have them sit on the floor and come together in groups. And they'll be much happier. They'll be much more attentive. And the, and the parents went wild. You can't take chairs out of a classroom. Why would you do that? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I had uh, I had the head of Y, uh, y Combinator's education-focused, uh, essentially, investment fund on uh, a while back. And he was like, yeah, we had, we had a lot of good ideas. But the thing is, when you got to tell parents... Well, we're going to do this split test, and Johnny over here, he's going to get the special material, and everyone else is going to get the not special material, but your son's in the not special material. Wait a sec, we can't make these changes if everyone doesn't get it as well, but if we make it, we might screw everybody. So it's the flip side, so what do we do? We do nothing. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So that's why, you know, it does take a certain amount of, it's an interesting set of leadership to make those changes happen, and I've become... A reluctantly interested in leadership. I certainly in the, earlier on in my career was, I guess, of, of that rather comfortable 
illusion that if we collaborated well together, then the need for a kind of, you know, leaders was was less important. And what I've realized is um, it's a different kind of leadership. It's it's a leadership of networks. It's a leadership of giving power to people rather than having power over them. But it's still leadership. And that's the kind of leaders we want. We want the ones that are like, shit, I don't want to do this, but there's no one else here to do it. As opposed yeah. to, as opposed to well, we won't get into what it's as opposed to, because that's not the fun stuff right now. It's a little controversial. So Virgin Earth, tell me about it. Uh, well, the Virgin Earth Challenge is a challenge, $25 million prize um, set up by Sir Richard Branson uh, to try and come up with one of the tools in the box for dealing with climate change, which is removing carbon from the atmosphere. So we're going to have to remove carbon from the atmosphere, whether we like it or not, because we're already past the point where it's too high. Um, so we can stop emitting carbon tomorrow. And we're still going to have to claim that back. Now, the, the ecosystem can do it. Indeed, some of the finalists in our prize are ecosystem um, solutions, like the sustainable farming I mentioned in my first book. So what it is is basically, you know, this is a prize. And to win it, you have to prove to the judges satisfaction. And the judges are people like Richard, but also um, uh, Al Gore, I think, is a judge. Um Oh, the guy, a guy, I've forgotten his name. Uh, Lovelock, James Lovelock is a judge. You know, there's some pretty high ranking judges. But before it even gets to the judges, it's been through an incredibly rigorous scientific and commercial analysis by a bunch of sort of university and partners and investment partners that we sort of have to advise the prize. And basically, to win the prize, you have to prove that you can remove carbon from the atmosphere at a gigaton scale in a scalable way and make a profit while you're doing it. And so we set up the prize. I say we, I wasn't around when it was set up, but the prize was set up in 2006. Um, it's not a beauty contest of who's the, who's the nicest, who's the nearest to it. It's like we will award the prize when we have convinced it that somebody has a scalable solution. So we haven't said very much. We've narrowed it down to 11 finalists from initial applications of about 2,000. All those 11, all of them, most of them, I would say, have a credible roadmap. None of them has yet have been awarded the prize because the criteria are extremely stringent. Um, and uh, that's all I can say. What, can you say the most promising solutions or some of the more interesting ones? Uh, no, I mean, I can talk about the general approaches, but I, I wouldn't say the most promising. Let's do, let's do general approaches. And then, and then, then we'll... I'm, I'm sort of prejudicing the, 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 the process. You know, because yeah, that... Sir, Sir Richard and Al Gore definitely listen to the disruptors as well. They're, uh, they're frequent cool. listeners, right? Yeah. I think they were your first two signups, weren't they? Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, the there are what you'd basically call scrubbing systems. Now, uh, carbon scrubbing is not a new technology. You actually had it in submarines since actually the 19th century. Because if you stay in a submarine for too long, you breathe out too much uh, carbon, and if that's the atmosphere, you die. So we've had scrubbers that keep carbon out of the atmosphere or recycle the atmosphere in submarines for you know hundreds of years now. Uh, so one approach is basically, can you scale up that technology to work in ambient air in a cheap way? And that is a non-trivial engineering challenge. Uh, and then how do you make a profit out of doing that? Because once you've taken the carbon out of the atmosphere, what do you do with it? Well, there's a number of things you can do with it. Okay, actually, if you enrich um, the air in a greenhouse with carbon, your tomatoes will grow quicker and juicier and whatever. So you can you take the carbon and put it in there. The other thing you do is you take the carbon and turn it into fuel. So hydrocarbons are hydrogen and carbon in various combinations. If you can take the carbon from the atmosphere, combine it with hydrogen from another source, you can make fuel out of it. In fact, we've been doing that since 1920 with something called the fischer tropsch process, which was invented by some German scientists and one of the techniques that kept the Nazis in uh, fuel um, and, uh, and apartheid South Africa as well. So we, but those two processes work, you know, we can take carbon out of the atmosphere, we can turn that carbon into fuel. Can you now combine them in a way to make carbon neutral fuel and sell that fuel? Because if you're, you can still burn the fuel, but if you're reclaiming it and putting it, put carbon back in, then it becomes this carbon neutral system, becomes a circular system. So that's one approach. Um, the other broad approach um, is um, agriculture and changing the way, for instance, the way we farm cattle or the way we plant our crops such that we'll be pulling much more carbon back into the soil, increasing the fertility of the soil in a virtuous circle. And there are ways of doing that as well. And those are, I guess, the two 
broad approaches that uh, that seem to have a commercial route to viability. There's some brilliant work being done by Arizona Arizona State University at the moment um, by a man called Peter Bick um, on the sustainable grazing, sustainable farming stuff. I really starting to quantify how much carbon we can pull back if we farm our cattle properly, as in you know more like nature would farm it than the way we do at the moment. Nobody's working with algae or seaweed or anything of that nature. I, I've heard that a roughly half of the, the carbon, basically the amount of plants in the ocean or in certain parts of the ocean pull out about, about, about the same amount of carbon as all of the trees and plants in the world. Yeah, I know, I've not heard that particular statistic. Um, the, the, the thing with the prize and the reason the prize is interesting is it doesn't say that any of these approaches are not interesting. But our very strict criteria is it has to be commercially viable because Richard's view is, and there is a lot to support this, is that if it's commercially viable, it will scale. Because if somebody could make money out of pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, then they'll go and pull carbon out of the atmosphere. So the ocean techniques, as far as I have seen, don't necessarily have a direct route to market because, you know, how do you get the carbon out and in what form? And what do you do with it? So um, it's not so those, those techniques aren't interesting, but for us, as far as I understand it, none of them have been able to develop a business model that looks credible going forward. You could sell you could sell the seaweed and algae and use those to replace. Uh, now you've got your nice little algae rocks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, this all changed. Of course, if the world's government started to put a proper price on carbon, then the economic the economics of things change. And indeed, you know, millions and billions of dollars worth of investment houses are saying to governments around the world, please put a price on carbon so that we can have an investment. Um, platform or investment environment and actually takes takes the future seriously because as investors actually we're quite keen on that it is the, it's the collective action problem we all want to do it but none of us can do it or feel that we can do it because we lose relative to others it's, yeah and it's, it's a bullshit all, problem and then we all lose you and know then, and so, then we all lose so then it's, yeah. it's all good we have to change the game somehow yeah and that's my job that's my day job is trying to change the game and speaking of day job atlas of the future i know you've been working on this a lot in terms of trying to change the game well, Alice the Future, actually, I'm kind of an advisor to that and, um, you know, was in at the beginning. And really all that is is a, is a kind of compendium of innovation, really. So we, I say we, I, I hardly have any day-to-day -day involvement, but uh, Kathy and Lisa who run it and their team, they are spending time collecting stories of innovation and everything from gender equality to climate change, whatever. So it's this place where when, one of the things that annoys me was when it's cynicism. You know, I always say that cynicism is obedience to the status quo. So you get a whole bunch of people betching about, you know, why the world is going to hell in the handcart and then saying, well, there's nothing we can do about it and there's no point in trying. So the Atlas is one of those great things you go. So you said it's impossible to change this thing. Well, let me show you 12 people, you know, you know, three from Southern Africa, you know, one from Malaysia, two in Texas, one in Venezuela, you know, who have already come up with solutions to that problem that are working. So you cannot tell me it's impossible. You might tell me it's hard, which is probably true, but it's no longer impossible. So it's a, it's a compendium of the possible futures that are out there to simply demonstrate to people when you say change can't happen, go and try to tell that, you know, to Azir over here, who's already made it happen in his village and is working because, you know, because it just silences that argument straight away. Yeah, the four minute miles impossible until it wasn't. And then suddenly everyone could do it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's it's it, and, 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 you know, the the. The, the bigger the atlas gets, the bigger the atlas gets, because what we tend to do is ask everybody who gets featured on it if they can recommend another innovative idea that they've heard of in their circle or whatever, and so it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the idea is that the atlas eventually becomes a platform for optimism based on innovation and future literacy. And uh, there's and we, we, we ran a conference last year in Barcelona. We're going to run another one this year in Barcelona uh, where we bring some of the best innovators together and sort of showcase them. Uh, there'll probably be a magazine with talking about possibly being a TV channel, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but we've got to build up the, the content. So. Do you know the Transition Network? We had Rob Hopkins on. He was the founder. Yeah. They're doing something similar. You should probably partner. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm almost convinced that Kathy is probably on the phone to him right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> always working with him already. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Rob's great. So what are some of the – we've talked a little bit about the big problems facing humanity, but what are some of the big – fears that you have around technologies and trends, things we haven't discussed as much yet. Are there any technologies that just scare you? Well, nuclear war, <laughs> you know, nuclear warheads, they, 
they scare me uh, as they should and they've kind of been sat in the background but actually you know any one of those things could go off and kill millions of people so so that worries me um there is the lack of well i'm not sorry that's not true there is certainly not as much innovation going on in antibiotic resistance as i would like so um we have drug resistant pathogens growing at a rate that is coding their ways around you know our drugs and our antibiotics and you know the last big flu Spanish flu, I think, in 1918, I think it was, killed 50 million people. And because there were no, no flu vaccines or antibiotics to really combat it. You know, if we end up in a similar situation again, you know, you're looking at hundreds of millions of people dying. So, but the biggest thing, the thing that scares me the most at the moment is, and it's been sort of the undercurrent of our entire conversation, is this lack of innovation in governance. This idea that the way you govern a world is by nation states run by elites either on one side or another that don't govern collectively. You know, the idea when, so to give an example, in the UK, you know, we kind of often talk about the fact we kind of invented parliamentary democracy. And isn't that wonderful? And we're great defenders of democracy. And you can go, look, when you invented parliamentary democracy and whenever it was, you know, the 19th century, late 18th century, Brilliant. Fantastic. Massive innovation. Well done. Round of applause. Standing ovation. I can't I can't tell you how brilliant that is. Why are we still using exactly the same system in 2019? The idea that you get to vote once every four years for these two you know, beer moth political parties that can't encompass complexity, that are run along lines that, you know, wouldn't have been unfamiliar in 1850 as a way to govern the complex interwoven technological world we have now is ridiculous. And that inefficiency in governance at that top level scares the crap out of me because you end up with what we've got at the moment which is people doubling down on the two-party be as extreme being one tribal of the system so you've got your trumps and you've got your brexits and you've got you know all this kind of stuff happening and all it seeks to do is to divide us at the time when we need to be closest together and working together so one of the things that's sort of another big sort of uh, cornerstone of my work is that people divided by politics are very soon brought together around projects. You get people to build something together and generally their politics disappears because it doesn't matter whether you're Democrat, Republican or in the middle or whatever, you ask a local um, you know, populace where the school needs to be built or where the traffic lights need to go or where the street lighting needs to be improved. You know what? They all pretty much agree. They all, their, all their disagreements will be minor. You know, so actually building stuff together and getting people involved in deciding where the money is spent, getting them involved in building their own communities, that's when the politics disappears. And uh, I love that kind of stuff. And, and in fact, all of the examples of systems change that I wrote about in my last book, you would find at some level of community coming together, kind of ignoring the politics and just deciding to build something better together, regardless of their background, gender, wealth or political leaning. And uh, maybe we might need aliens to have that happen to, to come in the threat. But in, in all seriousness, I think there are some challenges, especially with the U.S. system, because the system is designed to fail. Other, other European countries don't have that problem. But the U.S. specifically, if you have a winner-take-all system, you have to have only two parties. It kind of inevitably mm -hmm. leads to that. How do you disrupt something that doesn't itself want to be disrupted? Well, you know biggest question of all time um you know as i said and it's illegal bit, it's illegal to do so as well and you go to jail because it's treason yeah so there are the, so one of the things i covered in my last book was something that sounds very boring but i think is very powerful and it's called participatory budgeting and it's been happening in some large cities in brazil and a few other countries for a while now for 30 years and what the, what it says is um the government turns around to the people and says we collected your taxes, how would you like to spend them? You tell us how to spend them. They go through quite an expensive participatory system where anybody, if they want to, can get involved in deciding how the taxes get spent. Now, if you do this for a year or two, nothing much changes. People are pretty cynical. You know, nothing happens. You do it for 30 years, you change the culture, you change the political culture of a place. People expect to be consulted. They don't have to get involved, but they expect to be asked. And what you find is, and the World Bank's done these amazing studies that go on for, you know, for 20 or 30 years saying, if you look at a 
a large city of you know millions or more people that have been doing participatory budgeting for 20 or 30 years, then trust in politics goes up, partisan divide goes down, politicians are popular, all the public projects are better run, um, child mortality goes down, health improvements go up, education gets better, corruption almost evaporates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because what you've done is you've actually said to people, look, how would you like to spend your own taxes? And it turns out the more marginalized the people you involved, uh, the better the decisions are for everyone rich and poor alike. Because it turns out the poorest people make the smartest decisions about how to spend money, unsurprisingly. Which is not the mantra, of course, that we have you know, in a lot of the press, which is poor people are poor people because they're stupid. No, poor people are poor people because they're poor. And it's hard to get out of that. So if you give them the opportunity to say, well, how would you spend the money? They'll go, well, actually, the most sensible thing is to put a bridge between that neighborhood and that neighborhood because that will shorten everybody's time to work by three hours, which a city planner would never have seen. But how do you do that when, at least for most existing, uh, for a lot of existing countries and democracies, that's almost well, I think antithetical to everything that they are? Well, you do it probably at a municipal level, at a city level. So as cities can do this, uh, towns can do this. And what you will certainly see is most of the innovative stuff that's going on in terms of governments is happening at the city or town level. It's not happening at the federal level, for and, sure. And then it gains traction and it's like marijuana in the U.S. and eventually there's pressure to force yeah. that nationwide. Yeah. I mean, the thing is with these systems is they take things forever. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to keep pushing. So like the participatory budgeting thing, the example I just used, when they started off doing that, the very first example of it in a place called Porto Alegre, um, I think this was sort of like in the early 70s, the first attempt, they failed. It was miserable. It was an absolute disaster, complete disaster. Now Porto Alegre is, you know, uh, thriving to, to a large extent because they kept going at it and new, nuancing and nuancing it. So again, this is kind of this, back to this leadership you have to have, this systems leadership, this giving power to people, not giving up. It does take some of that kind of leadership, certainly. But the way it wins in the end is if you look at the economic. Oh, it's obvious. So, how, it's obvious how it wins. The question health, is how it starts. Okay. Yeah, how it how it starts is slowly, small, and you just don't give up. And the problem is, so I have this rule of uh, rule of ten in in the work I do in the work I, when I'm supporting people. Um, it's about how how success happens basically, and success happens by learning to lose. Uh, and I like to say, let, you know, I sort of break down every project and say, look, there's 10 rounds. Uh, so you're going from, and 10, when you've got to round 10, it's all working, everybody's accepted it, it's the new thing. But in round one, you're gonna go into the world with your new idea, and nine out of 10 people, nine, nine tenths of the money, nine tenths of your colleagues, friends, whatever, are gonna tell you to get lost. They don't like it, it doesn't work. Who are you anyway? Only 10% of people are gonna come around, only one out of 10. And you go to round two, and try it again, and you'll get to, 80% of people tell you to get lost. And round three, 70% of people tell you to get lost. What happens in my experience, and this used to happen to me all the time, I used to do this, was everybody gives up in round three. Because you've been going at this new thing for maybe a year, two years, and maybe you're about to get fired. Maybe you're annoying some people that you know are your friends. Maybe you're worried about your career. And then you can also say, look, I gave it my best shot. I've been doing this two years. All of my colleagues are telling me it's not gonna work. Lots of people I respect. I can put this to bed with a clear conscience. At least I gave it my best shot and I can just get back to the day job. Um, and that's never the time to give up. It's just round three. But you have to get to round five. And what I say to my clients is like, unless you're prepared to lose more often than you win until halfway through the game, you'll never change anything. But it means you have to lose all the way up to round five and then you start winning. But nobody, lots of people don't have the funding, energy, vision to get to round five they don't understand that being kicked in the nuts you know seven times out of ten is better than being kicked in the nuts eight times out of ten because they're still being kicked in the nuts more often than they're not and it's going to take another few years of being kicked in the nuts before you suddenly start realizing that your nuts are going to be bathed in butter i didn't think we would get to that and possibly, no. and possibly uh. deep fried so the, <laughs> the the problem i see is brazil it's much easier for the the young guns to take to go for innovation. This is why startups create most of the innovation worldwide is they don't have much to lose. Whereas arguably the, the US government, there's nothing that's ever been bigger that's had more to lose. Yeah, but... Um, and yet it's losing terribly. Yeah, and it gets to a point where the cost of not changing becomes so high that you have, that you have to. And how, I think how close are we to that point? Oh, I mean, I think you're already seeing it. I mean, if you look at, you know, the shutdown, you look at the way American politics is at the moment, same over here. I mean, 
wh whatever you voted on the Brexit debate over here, if you look at the way our um, government, and I use the term loosely, uh, is handling that question, that governance question, that how do we you know, extricate ourselves from the European Union in a sensible way that doesn't destroy livelihoods in the economy and you know keeps all these various factions happy. If you look at how they've managed that, it's an absolute disaster. So it's very clear, I think, to everybody. And you know, I think pretty much everybody agrees that the governance systems we have don't work. But W. E. Deming, the engineer, once said, um, defects uh, don't come for free. Somebody gets paid for making them. And the problem is we have people paid to do the job they're already doing, keep on doing it, even if the job they're doing is bad for society. And that's government. Got huge amounts of people justifying their life, saying, you know, well, I work for the government, I do good work, without really understanding, again, systemically, that the actual thing they're doing is keeping in situ a thing that's now harmful. Um, and... You know, this is why I do what I do. I, I mean, I don't know what the solution is. I just, I just know what, what mine is, which is to do the job I do and keep on going. And hopefully people will listen and, and occasionally hire me. <laughs> if there's not a big shift in the U.S. government, how long until the American empire falls? Well, it depends on what you call the empire. I mean, really, empires are about trade. Uh, so as long as you're producing stuff and trading it, then you'll still have some kind of power. Let's say, let's say a top a top three position in the world? Oh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I, re I mean, and, and one of the reasons I kind of don't like being called a futurist is because I don't like making predictions because predictions are passive. If I said it's going to be 10 years and then the American economy will be the 10th in the world as opposed to whatever is now joint first with China. And that could be wrong because suddenly things might change. People might decide that they're going to do things differently. There might be, you know, I don't know, Bernie Sanders might get in next time and do a wholesale rethink of of the, how the Senate and the, you know works and all that kind. Of, I don't know, you know, that could change. So um, I think we should always just be aiming for the possible rather than hoping for the collapse. I agree as well. That's a that's a great optimist place to start wrapping things up here. <laughs> What's something we should have talked about that we didn't? Uh, my band, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah, what do you got? What do you guys play? Uh, we just got an album out in the UK. Um, actually, well, it's be released in America as well because it's all streamed these days. So yeah, no, I was kind of joking, but yeah, I'm one. Of, as I say, I, I have an artistic life as well, and one of those is playing in a in a progressive rock band called Quantum Pig. Um, and our first album has had exclusively good reviews, not a single bad review. So check it out. I mean, but and more seriously, I think we kind of touched on it, but the relationships between um, keeping an artistic practice up in your life and your ability to then affect change. I find that the skills that I get hired for, the places where I have my greatest successes, whether that's with a big investment house or a large corporation or a big NGO, pretty much all of those skills came from songwriting, playwriting, stand-up, understanding an audience, learning how to move them from one place to another and taking them on a journey. And that's the thing that I think we don't have nearly enough of um, in in the world, you know, more rounded sort of careers like that. So I, I, I keep up my artistic practice. A, I get paid for it. It's great fun. I love doing it. But I tell you what, when I walk into a boardroom, you know, because I've done stand up to a bunch of drunk plumbers on a Tuesday night in a dodgy club in London, there is no CEO that's going to scare me. I don't mind telling the truth. You, you're nothing to me. You know, I told jokes about the climate change and number theory to a drunk hen night. <laughs> So you, you think you as an investor is going to intimidate me? You get no chance. <laughs> yeah, it gives, you, it gives you a way with people. There's probably a reason why Jobs was so creative and uh, rocked some of the LSD. I think some of those things definitely impacted who he was and some of the trajectory. I think it happens a lot of times with creators. You just don't always see it. Yeah, I mean, what it Einstein says? If you, if, you, if you take the route that everybody else has gone on, you're going to end up where everybody else has gone. Whereas if you take the route that nobody has gone on, you're going to end up somewhere different. And certainly I've ended up somewhere different than, you know, most of my contemporaries because people go, how the hell did you create that job? I'm like, I don't know, just kind of followed my heart <laughs> and my interests, you know, against what some would consider economic sense. You know, when, when, you know, I mean, I got a first class honors degree in computing science and decided to join a pop band, you know, like my dad was literally tearing his <laughs> And what are you doing that? For? I said, well, you know, there's something in this ability to tell a story that I'm more interested in. So, 
follow your follow your, I mean that you know it's always this case isn't it follow your passions if you follow your passions you'll end up being good at it if you're good at it you get paid for it I like that is there anything else you'd want to add for people a quote a call to action something that really inspires people before we start to wrap things up and tell them where to find you um I think actually it is that rule of three thing you know you are going to get to that point when you're trying to do something new where you just feel I have no energy I've throw my life at this i'm looking at the cash flow or whatever and it's a disaster my relationship with my nearest and dearest is slightly frayed i'm not in a good mood i'm feeling slightly unhealthy everybody's kicking me in the nuts and i I've, i'm losing my my faith somewhere something is not happening and that when i when i see that happening with the people that i consult at the startups i go you know this is the moment you win because this is the moment every single one of your competitors who's had roughly the same idea at the same time as they all have and are trying to do this thing, that's when they're all dropping out. Good and you, you just have to keep going. And I don't care how you do it. You have to take a night job in a bar to sort that cash problem to keep going. This is where you win, when it's absolutely at its hardest. And, um, and that puts the fire back in the tank and they can do it for another uh, year. And all of a sudden they go, hey. We got to round five, and now everybody wants to give us money or work for us or, or coffee. It's a good, that's a good piece of advice. That's a good place to wrap things up, and it's something that everybody forgets. Everybody. It's, a, yeah. it's hard. It is. I've got it all the time for a long time, and now when I find myself at that moment, it's like, oh, oh, good. Yeah, it's really hard. This is good. This is where, this is where I'm winning. <laughs> yeah, finally, we got to the shitty part to get rid of everybody else. So yeah. Where's the best place for people to find you, Mark? <laughs> somewhere in the middle of the shitty bit probably uh markstevenson.org is is my website it's very simple it just tells you a bit about who i am you can find links to my books and there's a contact details at the bottom and stuff so that's that's it. and on twitter i'm at optimist on tour now one last or, thing or by the the band of course which is at quantum pig band this is clearly a very important thing it's a very important <laughs> thing speaking of important things i want to wrap up joke before we before we go away what's that what's a quick one knock knock or otherwise Oh God, um, this, no, this is terrible. You put me on the spot. Um, I'll tell you um, though a joke. This isn't this is this is one that my three year old um, loves, and he told me this the other day, and it cracked me up. He said, uh, he came up to me and said, "Daddy, ask me why I'm holding this fish." I go, "Why are you holding that fish?" He goes, "Just for the halibut." <laughs> <laughs> the puns at three, you're in for trouble. Yeah, I love just, just for the hell of it. Guys, for thanks, <laughs> thanks for coming, Mark. This has been fun. Yeah, absolutely. I really enjoyed it. And thanks for tuning in, guys. If you've enjoyed this, you know what to do. Disruptors.fm, subscribe, share it with friends. And if you want to support us on Patreon, disruptors.fm slash Patreon. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Cool. Right, so I have recording.